I've never had a countdown before, so thanks. <laughs> it's appropriate for a NASA webinar, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, well, hello everyone and welcome to the September NASA Night Sky Network member webinar. We are hosting tonight's webinar from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific in San Francisco, California, but we are strewn all over the country from coast to coast tonight as uh, we are many times. We're very excited to present this webinar with our guest speaker, Dr. Paul Abel, the Chief Scientist for Small Body Explorations at NASA's Astro Materials Research and Exploration D Division at the Johnson Space Center. Welcome to everyone joining us on YouTube. We're very happy to have you with us. These webinars are monthly events for members of the Night Sky Network. For more information about the NASA Night Sky Network and the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, check the links in the chat that we'll put in there in just a few moments. Before we introduce Paul, here's Dave Prosper with just a few announcements. All righty. Hi, folks. Okay. Let's see. I'm just going to get the... Uh... Oh, sorry. I got to switch to... There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Serious announcer voice. All right there, just a couple quick announcements. Uh, I just wanna keep it quick. Our pins are being manufactured, very exciting. And the will, when they arrive at my doorstep, hopefully by early October, I'm gonna send out the announcement with all the details so you can order these awesome new Outreach Awards pins for all your folks work in 2021. And uh, just so you know, just your club just needs to add two reports to your events for the year. Uh, we will always love it if you add more reports and we encourage you to do so, but we realize that many folks are still operating under many restrictions. So just a couple would be handy. Thank you very much. And we can help you out with that if you need. Um, that's what we're here for. Uh, we have a couple more fun announcements. So as we come into October, we are having the global moon party on October 9th from 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern with folks from the NSN International Observe the Moon Night and the Explore Alliance. And the schedule and links to join will be in our next newsletter. And there's a little bit in our past as well. Um, you can also, but also if you want to, you can subscribe to the channel and get an alert when we're live on YouTube. And I'll put the link to both the YouTube event and uh, everyone in the chat. Uh, right in the details and schedule as well. And one more quick announcement is that the ASP is having their 133rd annual meeting and astronomy educators and communicators of all stripes are invited. And the early bird registration and abstract submissions are both, uh, the deadline is October 6th. And uh, for more info, you can go to astrosociety.org or the link in the chat and YouTube, you're gonna be in there in a second. <laughs> Alrighty, that is it for me. Thank you all, folks. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Dave. So for those of you on Zoom, you can find both the chat window and the Q&A window in your Zoom um, menu bar on your desktop. Please feel free to greet each other in the chat window or to let us know if you're having any technical difficulties. You can also send us an email at nightskyinfo at astrosociety.org. If you have a question for our guest speaker this evening, please type it into the Q&A window. Uh, that helps us to keep track of them and not lose them, which is always a really good thing. So I'm going to hit the local recording here. Welcome to the September webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. This month, we welcome Dr. Paul Abel to our webinar. Dr. Paul Abel is the chief scientist for the small body exploration within the Astro Materials Research and Exploration Science Division at Johnson Space Center. His main areas of interest are physical characterization of near earth objects via ground based and spacecraft observations, examination of NEOs for future robotic and human exploration, and identification of potential resources within the NEO population for future in situ utilization. As a geologist, it's always fun to see where we can go uh, dig up more minerals and find interesting rocks. And so it sounds like Paul is actively interested in finding some of those rocks for us. So thank you. Abel has been studying potentially hazardous asteroids and near-Earth objects for over 15 years and is an investigation team member on NASA's Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART mission, which is what you're going to find out 
about in just a couple minutes here. So please welcome Dr. Paul Abel. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Okay, I'm going to uh, share my screen here and let's see if we can get things rolling. Let me know if that's coming through okay? It looks great. Okay, get started. All right, well, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, this presentation is you and for you. And um, basically, this is all about uh, planetary defense and defending Earth from hazardous asteroids, which is uh, one of the, the things that we are uh, very interested at at NASA and one of the things, actually, that we are, are charged to do um, by the, the presidential administration. Uh, obviously, this is a big uh, effort. This is uh, uh, just to give you an idea of the number of organizations and the number of people uh, that are involved in the double asteroid redirection test. Um, lots of lots of uh, university, um, agency, industry, and uh, government support. So it's a it's a big team, and we also have international partners as well, uh, uh, with members from Italy. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Okay, just a little bit about the present uh, presentation outline, uh, go over some recent impact events, um, a little bit about introduction of asteroids, uh, what are they and where do they come from. So this is a very high level overview. Some of the potential impact consequences, um, talk a little bit more in depth about the DART uh, kinetic impact mission and what some of the objectives are. And then uh, talk about a companion mission that we are actually working with our European Space Agency partners with. Uh, it's the Hera rendezvous mission. And then sum up with some closing closing thoughts. And uh, I think as uh, uh, Brian said, there will be some time for, for questions as well. So this is a little dramatic, but uh, there's a, an event in Russia in Chelyabinsk uh, 2013. Uh, caught everybody by surprise. Um, this was one of my best days ever. Actually, not really. Uh, it was a really, really busy day for me. Um, and it was one of the things that just happens and uh, we didn't expect it. And it was a very bright and dramatic effect. Lots of energy. Fortunately, uh, no one was, was killed, um, but there was a significant number of people hurt. And 100 people went to hospital um, but over 1,600 people were injured as a result of the uh, shock wave. So this is actually a video uh, of what uh, people saw on the ground. Um, so there's that big contrail. And that's the moment the shock wave actually hits. And so you can see these people looking at the contrail, reacting to the shock wave. And that was a result of a meteor only about uh, our bolide, I should say, about 20 meters across, um, coming in uh, in excess of speed of about 40,000 miles per hour and detonating at an altitude of around 29 kilometers. And there's some video here just showing you the effect of the actual shock wave, even though it exploded relatively really high up, it still propagated down to the ground and, and caused significant amount of damage. Uh, notice this, uh, these people have seen the flash, they see the contrail, they're looking outside, this is an office, and then the shockwave hits uh, about 90 seconds to uh, a minute later, or a little, few minutes later, and uh, people are uh, shocked, um, there's some damage, and they're, they don't know what exactly is happening. Watch what happens to this door, again blown over uh, from the result of, of the shockwave. So, um, there was lots of video. I encourage you to go online and, and look at this. Um, you can see what happened to these two people. Uh, they're enjoying their morning. This was about half past nine in the morning. And um, a lot of people thought actually it was a terrorist attack or some type of an attack and they weren't sure. So uh, they rapidly evacuated. So um, damage estimated was about 33 million uh, US dollars. Uh, the initial meteor uh, weighed about 12,000 tons. Um, it punched a hole in the lake, as you see here. Um, the the diameter of the hole is about six meters, and they actually recovered a sizable fraction, uh, the terminal piece, which is about 1,400 pounds, and it was uh, recovered. Um, lots and lots of pieces were collected by um, 
members of the public, um, and uh, it turned out to be a uh, ordinary uh, chondrite type of object, but heavily shocked. So that was interesting. And again, that's a topic of a, a, a completely separate talk. But anyway, just to give you an idea of what the actual uh, meteorite uh, was associated with this particular asteroid. So again, uh, just to give context, this is uh, for what we're dealing with here. Here's, here's the Earth looking down on the solar system. We have asteroids, the asteroid belt uh, in between Mars and Jupiter. Most of the objects that come at us um, that we are interested in, uh, about 95% of the objects that are near Earth objects come from the asteroid belt. So we focus more of our attention on, on this particular area. They're obviously the leftover uh, bits, the rocky remnants of planet formation. And interactions in the main asteroid belt send material both inward and outward. And it's the inward material that we have to uh, worry about. Lots and lots of uh, objects. The uh, diagram or the uh, animation that you see here on the lower right hand side is looking down on the solar system, the red, orange, type objects are the near Earth asteroids. The green are those uh, main belt asteroids. So we focus more of our attention, obviously, on the near Earth asteroids for planetary defense. But keep in mind, there's um, reasons to do so for science exploration and then uh, resource utilization as well. So just to give you a sense of scale of what we're talking about, uh, here's Earth, here's Moon, here's uh, dwarf planet Ceres. Um, just to give you an idea of scale. Zooming in now, there's Ceres on the far right and four Vesta on the left, and then um, some main belt asteroids. And that tiny, tiny dot right at the bottom, which is about 500 meters across, is the asteroid Itakawa that was uh, visited by the Hayabusa uh, spacecraft um, uh, about, a, about a decade ago, 2007. More recently, um, we have looked at um, asteroids and we've had spacecraft go to two asteroids, um, serendipitous. We've had um, our own mission, OSIRIS-REx, and we had a Japanese mission called Hayabusa-2. I was fortunate enough to be involved with both of these missions. And these were science missions. These weren't necessarily planetary defense, although there's lots of planetary defense knowledge learned when you go to these particular types of near-Earth objects. So on the left-hand side, it was uh, the asteroid Rugu. It's about uh, a kilometer across, and it was uh, visited by Hayabusa 2. And then Bennu on the right, uh, which is about half the, half the diameter, about half a kilometer, and it was uh, visited by OSIRIS-REx. Uh, just to give people a context, Hayabusa 2 is successfully returned, and we have samples of Rugu um, in the laboratories being analyzed right now. Um, we have some particles here at Johnson Space Center. We expect uh, some more uh, samples to come back in uh, December timeframe, and we're making arrangements to receive those. Um, Cyrus-Rex samples, um, Cyrus-Rex doesn't come back until about two years from now, uh, September uh, of 2023. But stay tuned, and uh, it's looking good. The spacecraft's still healthy, and so in two years, we're going to be uh, very happy with lots of uh, asteroid samples uh, here at JSC, at Johnson Space Center. OK, so everybody, I think, is familiar with impact craters. Uh, one of the more famous impact craters we have in the United States is the Behringer Meteor Crater in Arizona. Uh, it was formed about 50,000 years ago uh, by a approximately 50 meter uh, diameter metallic asteroid. Remember I said Chelyabinsk was an ordinary chondrite. It was a rocky, this, this astero asteroid that hit in uh, Meteor Crater is metallic. The crater is about uh, 1.2 kilometers in diameter. It's about 180 meters deep. It's near, located near Winslow, Arizona. Uh, I recommend that if anybody has a chance to go and visit it, if you haven't, it's, it's well worth the trip. Uh, just make sure that take plenty of water because it, it does get very hot uh, hot there and especially in inside the crater itself if you get to uh, go near it and, and around it. Anyway, you can see from the diagram on the right, uh, meteor crater is centered there. Uh, this is the estimated um, sort of energy or blast uh, zones that were associated with this particular crater. So out to 10 kilometers, there was a fireball. 
um, then at 24 kilometers, you had more of a, a blast plus uh, heat and out further, you have hurricane force winds out to 40 kilometers. So this is sort of gives you an idea of, of the, the type of devastation that this, these objects can have, even though they're relatively small, um, they do tend to pack a punch. So here is the same scale, but this is uh, centered over uh, Washington DC uh, with Virginia and Maryland uh, for reference. And again, just the same contours of the fireball and other devastation regions. So you can see over a metropolitan center, a small asteroid would definitely cause um, a lot of damage. So right now at NASA, what our, our plans are is that we are working uh, to stop Think of ways of means of stopping ease in some of these smaller asteroids that are relatively hard to detect um, and prevent them from hitting the earth and not just the United States, but all over the world. That's one of the things that we, uh, we work on. We also do this by um, doing exercises at planetary defense conference. So we had a planetary defense conference in 2019 in college park, Maryland. And this was just sort of a, an example of, what could happen if you had a 60 meter asteroid uh, impacting over Manhattan and uh, lots and lots of energy released, um, very more powerful than some of the uh, nuclear weapons that were dropped in World War II. And you can see some of the uh, unsurvivable and um, uh, orange, orange zones where things get harder and harder. So red is un unsurvivable uh, as you move further out, it gets a little bit easier, but uh, still, uh, would be very hard on a type of population and a lot of structures and, and damage done. So again, uh, one of the reasons why we're, we're, we're doing this. So here's a, a plot that I'm showing in terms of why this is a global concern. As I mentioned, we do this uh, not only for the United States, but the, uh, the entire world. And this is uh, fireballs that are reported um, from 1988 to now. Uh, this chart was the most recent event was September 6th. And so this is a result of high altitude air bursts um, coming in and hitting the atmosphere uh, from small asteroids. And as you notice, they, they come in from all sorts of different directions and they hit everywhere uh, across the planet. There's no one preferred orientation, uh, no one preferred time frame. And Chelyabinsk, is this object you can see up in the uh, the biggest red dot that was the example 20 meters it was about uh, 500 and, uh, 500 kilotons of tnt so uh, actually 440 kilotons of tnt and these type of objects fortunately don't happen very often uh, every few decades to centuries but again we want to be prepared for these type of things especially tunguska Sibes object um, that was the event in 1908 in tunguska siberia and that was a much larger object detonated uh, much lower to the ground. So Chelyabinsk for reference was about 29 kilometers. Um, Tunguska, a little bit bigger object, penetrated deeper into the atmosphere and detonated uh, um, and about five to six kilometers and uh, wiped out uh, 2,400 square kilometers of forest. And then of course, people I think are very familiar with the, the Chicxulub sized dinosaur killer um, that happened about 65 million years ago and, and uh, caused a major global level extinction event. So here's the hazard by the numbers, uh, just to give people an idea. Again, this is not to scare people, but this is just to, you know, sort of give people an idea of what we're dealing with. So how big, uh, ranging, you know, talking about four meters all the way up to 10,000 meters, and then how many per year you can see how many of these types of impacts that we could probably uh, expect, and then how bad um, things would be. Our atmosphere is actually really pretty good at protecting us. Uh, even Chelyabinsk, even though it was a 20 meter object, the, the atmosphere did a pretty good job, although people still get it, uh, got hurt. So we still have to be mindful that even relatively small objects can cause a lot of damage. And so um, the bottom uh, section there of this chart shows us exactly how we're doing in terms of finding uh, these types of objects. So for the really large ones, um, 
they're much easier to detect and find. And we're doing pretty well on the 1,000 meter and 10,000 meter objects. We're almost at complete completion, which is which is good to know because that uh, those are the objects that can uh, wipe out uh, humanity on the planet. Um, getting further down, though, when you start looking at things that are in the 160 meter range and smaller, we have some work left to do. Um, so again, this is where we're concentrating our efforts in looking at some of the smaller ob objects that are more numerous and statistically more likely to, to cause a bad day in, in the time frame of interest. So here's our former NASA administrator. This is at the Planetary Defense Conference, and this is the statement that he made. And it, it really is uh, protecting uh, the planet and defending life as we know it on, on our planet Earth. So we do have a um, Planetary Defense Coordination Office at NASA. Uh, the Planetary Defense Coordination Office is centered at, at NASA headquarters. And we have um, various centers that uh, liaise with uh, headquarters, and we have different uh, roles and responsibilities. So there's the, the search, detect, and track. That's probably the, the first pillar. You have to see the object coming um, and detect it, know that that actually is a hazard. Then you have to characterize um, the object, figure out, you know, is it is it really something to worry about or is it going to explode harmlessly in uh, the atmosphere? And then plan and coordinate what you're going to do about it and then mitigate and whether you actually uh, do something about it with a spacecraft mission like DART or, or not. So again, find the hazards and then defend against them. And this is where DART comes in, as you see, which is the, the first planetary defense demonstration mission that we are, uh, we're talking about doing. So here is uh, a little bit about the mission, just sort of a, a cartoon uh, our launch window opens up uh, November 24th, 2021, goes through February uh, 15th of 2022. It's actually a really uh, large launch season, um, which is good. It gives us lots of flexibility to make sure that we can launch on time. Uh, we did, uh, we were going to launch a little bit earlier, but we had some COVID impacts, um, which prevented us from, from completing. But we were able to make this secondary launch window, which we'll still have no uh, change to our overall objectives of the mission. But the the DART uh, mission and the DART spacecraft, um, the target is a binary asteroid. It's uh, the Didymo system. So the primary object is about 780 meters. It's called Didymos. It rotates once every about 2.26 uh, hours. And we are going after the 160 meter uh, companion uh, which orbits around it uh, once every 11.92 hours, and it's called Dimorphos. And the time of impact is um, going to be uh, September, late September, early October of 2022. Um, that date will be fixed once we uh, know the actual launch date, but it's going to be um, right around that that time frame. Um, the double asteroid redirection. Uh, test uh, mission is involves two spacecraft. Um, basically, it's the DART spacecraft. It's about 676 kilograms. It's traveling about 6.6 uh, kilometers per second. And um, it's going to hit into Dimorphos as a test of the kinetic impact. Riding along with it and then deployed uh, about uh, 10 days uh, prior to impact is the uh, Italian contribution which is the Lidice cube, which is the light Italian CubeSat for imaging of asteroid. And so that is going to help us characterize um, the actual impact itself, um, some of the ejecta and what actually happens to Dimorphos and possibly even uh, Didymos. So that's a, a very important uh, perspective to have so we can actually see what we did and how, how well we did. In addition to that, we have our Earth-based observations um, which are uh, at, the, at the time only going to be about 6.8 million miles away, 0 0.07 AU uh, from the impact location. And so we're going to be able to leverage lots and lots of ground-based observatories uh, and also space-based observatories. We're going to try and use Hubble as well uh, to see uh, what we can determine about the uh, DART impact and, and into uh, Dimorphos. 
So here's Dart at scale. Um, just to give you an idea, again, Dart is uh, 676 uh, kilograms. With the solar panels uh, rolled out, it's, uh, it's about uh, 19 meters. And so uh, when we hit, uh, it's a cross section of 19 meters. Um, just to give a sense of scale, there's some other uh, objects there, the Arc de Triomphe, Statue of Liberty. Dimorphos is 163 meters and uh, compare that to the Eiffel Tower and the One World Trade Center and then uh, Didymos uh, there again. So just to give you an idea of sense of scale. Um, so it's a very small spacecraft moving at a very high speed. Um, the asteroid is relatively small at 160 meters, but we're still going to be able to um, measure the effects of this kinetic impact test. So here's our eyes. This is the, the Draco instrument. So basically, uh, DART has one instrument, Draco. It's a basically telescopic camera um, that actually homes in on uh, the asteroid system first, then picks out uh, Dimorphos, and then uh, goes in uh, to hit. We'll get some inf information, obviously, from the Draco instrument. But as I said, the Leechia cube uh, small sat that will be deployed prior to the impact will actually uh, tell us a, a lot of information about the impact itself and actually more information about uh, dimorphos. So one of the things <laughs> that's really interesting about this, um, which is basically exciting in, in many sense of the word, is that we don't really know too much about the object we, we're going to hit. Uh, we do have some ground-based information uh, prior of the of the dimorphous system. Uh, we know, as I said, it's a binary. Um, we have some radar in it. So we have a radar shape model. We have light curve information. So we know how fast things are, are rotating. Um, we have a rough estimate of the size of uh, dimorphos. But we, we really don't know too much about uh, dimorphos itself. Nor do we know um, what the, the, the surface is like or the internal structure. We have an idea of the, the meteorite type. It's, it's similar to that ordinary chondrite uh, type of meteorite that I, I mentioned earlier with, with Chelyabinsk. But again, uh, nothing is, is, is certain. So uh, that's why it makes it a, a bit exciting. So we don't really know what we're going to find, um, and we don't know what it's going to look like. Um, pretty sure it's not going to look like a, a dog bone, um, but there's lots of different options of whether it's going to be uh, more spheroidal. Is it going to be top shaped like uh, Didymos itself, you know, what we see from the radar images, or is it it's going to be sort of oblong? Or does it have any other type of features? Um, these are all things that are going to be um, really interesting to, to try and figure out. So this is sort of giving you um, an idea. So we the spacecraft is moving incredibly fast, right? It's 6.6 .6 kilometers per second. So things happen very, very quickly. Um, and so, you know, 60 minutes out, an hour from impact, um, we actually see uh, Didymos uh, for the first time. Um, we see the system. And uh, then about four minutes prior to impact, um, we start to resolve uh, the secondary and actually hone in on it. Um, you know, two minutes out, we, we get a bit closer and now we're really focused on uh, Dimorphos. And then it's not until 20 seconds where we get our sort of our last set of images where we get um, the high, highest resolution we have, which we think is going to be about 50 centimeters per pixel to understand what the surface is going to be like. So things are happening very quick. And the, just so you know, this uh, image on the, on the right here, the last uh, 20 second image, that's um, from the Hayabusa uh, spacecraft image at Itakawa. So uh, the spacecraft has to be uh, very autonomous and has to uh, do things very quickly in order to, to hit it. And that's one of the things when you were talking about planetary defense, and especially with the kinetic impact, things have to be done autonomously and under very, very tight time constraints in order to hit because you're moving at such high speed. Um, believe it or not, 6.6 uh, .6 kilometers per second is considered relatively slow 
uh, for something that we'd probably do if we had to do something operational. We'd probably have to do maybe do twice the speed. But again, this is just a demonstration mission on a well-known uh, characterized system, not necessarily Demorphos is well-known, but the system itself is well-characterized. So this gives you an idea of just the, the general orbit uh, and gives some uh, timing. So we have Earth in blue, we have Dart launch, and um, then we have the encounter. And you can see why we picked this particular uh, time period encounter is because of the proximity to, to Earth at the time. So this is what al allows us to use our ground-based systems and near Earth space uh, space systems to actually observe. So it's a, it's a really uh, fortuitous encounter, and we we picked this. Um, so here are our requirements, and so the first thing, of course, is number one is we got to hit the asteroid, right? I mean that's sort of a no brainer. We we need to hit the asteroid. In order to understand how well uh, we hit it. Um, we want to be able to change the binary orbital period on Dimorphos. So we need to cause a greater than 73 second change in the orbital period of Dimorphos. And in fact, what we're going to do is we're probably going to slow the orbit down because we're going to be hitting uh, Dimorphos head on with this particular orientation. And step three there, we've, we've going to measure the period change to within 7.3 seconds um, before and after impact. That will tell us, help us in inform how much energy we've transferred to the object and uh, determine how much momentum. And then hopefully in combination with, with some of the observations we get from Lucci Cube and some modeling that we're doing is we're going to measure beta and characterize the impact site uh, and dynamics. So knowing how the asteroid responds, how much material is thrown back, what we call ejecta, um, that's important to know, and that also enhances the amount of momentum, the amount of oomph that is transferred uh, to the asteroid. So this is the ideal uh, target. Um, again, here's the original orbit. Uh, we're going around. We're going to see it from the lower left-hand side from Earth, and then uh, DART is going to come in and uh, smack into uh, Dimorphos. And we're actually going to hit it head on. And uh, there's Lucci Cube that will see and characterize the event and also Dimorphos after the fact. And then it will take a bit of time to relay the information. And then hopefully we'll be able to determine a new orbit, which will, will slow down. So a couple of reasons for, for doing this is one, it's a well-characterized target. It's in a binary uh, system orbit, so we can characterize uh, this very well from the ground. And also, it's representative of a type of object in terms of size, the 160 meters, that we're interested in being able to, to try and deflect, seeing as those types of objects, if they did come in and hit the Earth, would, would really give us a bad day. So here it is again, just the, the complete uh, show. And uh, it just uh, emphasizes um, the type of information, the type of demonstration mission that we're doing. So. We're doing lots and lots of observations. We've done lots and lots of observations. And we continue to do so to help uh, understand the system. Um, a lot of people, I think, because you're uh, astronomers, you, you will know a lot of these facilities. Um, and so we have facilities all over the United States and also all over the world that are helping out, uh, trying to characterize the system, refining orbital periods, refining uh, libration modes of the binary. Uh, characterizing the system to a to high degree. And of course, uh, come around the time of impact, we'll be doing even more um, ground-based observations and, and space-based observations to try and characterize uh, the system and actually see what we can see as a result of the, uh, as a result of the impact. So this is just to give you an idea of, uh, you know, again, binary, uh, measuring the, the binary orbital period, and you can see these little dips, the, the brightness as the asteroid moves in front of and behind uh, the primary, uh, you can see the change in brightness. And so we're, we've got a baseline measurement of that right now. And then after the impact, we will be able to see how much that has changed over time. And that will give us some indication of 
how well we've actually um, transferred the energy into it, which will then give us more confidence in how we can do this in in a real case, in case we have to do it. Again, this is a demonstration. We we practice. Um, we want to practice this. We don't have to do it right the first time when when things are really counting, uh, when people are counting on us, and we have to do it right. So. You practice uh, musical instrument, you practice plays, you practice sports, and planetary defense is no different. So I mentioned beta uh, before, which is actually a, a momentum enhancement. So when you run into an asteroid uh, and you just uh, have no ejecta and you just run into it with a spacecraft or you, you run into it with something, uh, you'll get a momentum uh, transfer but you won't get any increase. So if you have an impact here, you um, transfer momentum and the asteroid is diverted a little bit, but that's beta equal to one, right? So when you have an asteroid impact, however, and you have um, moderate ejecta, right? So now you have some ejecta coming back. That ejecta acts as a little exhaust a rocket thrust as well. So material is flung back. So in this case, uh, you can get enhancement from the actual impact. It's the same uh, speed of impact, but the situation has changed because for whatever reason, the object is producing uh, more ejecta from the similar type of energy. So your momentum enhancement is now double. And then of course, if you get a really energetic uh, ejecta, lots of material thrown back, you can get ejectas, uh, beta factor of four. So much more in what we call momentum enhancement. So what we're trying to do is not only prove that we can hit the asteroid, but try and understand how much uh, of this beta factor that we may get. And uh, it'll be very interesting to see, do we get a beta of one? Do we get a beta of two or four? Or, you know, in the odd case, do we get a beta that is less than what we expect? Uh, we don't think that's going to happen, but again, this is one of the, the reasons why we, we do this test. And this is important knowledge to know because we'd like to know how hard we have to hit an asteroid if we're actually having to deflect it. And keep in mind, all asteroids aren't made the same. Lots of different ty compositional types and lots of different shapes and lots of different internal structures. So again, this is our first uh, test and first data point of this particular kinetic impact demonstration. So here's one of the uh, uh, sort of ideas of, uh, remember I talked about internal structure and beta, and you can see some of these modeling runs that have been done by my colleagues using supercomputer models. So um, the, the box on the, on the left, there's no porosity. Um, the object is solid and the beta value is uh, a certain value. Uh, the one in the center has a little bit of micro porosity. The beta value decreases a little bit, funnily enough. And then the rubble pile, um, loosely held ma together material, um, the beta value is changed again and, and a little bit higher. So the takeaway from this is that uh, as far as our understanding goes in terms of computer models, the porosity, the internal structure of the object and the material composition actually do matter. And so this is something that, again, we're trying to figure out uh, and understand if we have to divert um, a hazardous object. So all this, just so you know, this is part of a, uh, a larger strategy um, for planetary defense. We actually um, are guided by the National Air Near Earth Object Preparedness Strategy and Action Plan. Uh, this came out in June of 20, uh, 2018. It has five goals. Um, three of them are, are um, are much more relevant to NASA. The other two are as well, but the first three, uh, detection, tracking, and characterization, modeling and information integration, and then deflection and disruption mitigation uh, are uh, well inside NASA's purview. And then of course, goal four is increase cooperation with our international partners and then strengthen and exercise impact protocols. That's uh, basically FEMA and Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and we work with them as well. But DART fits right in here. Um, this is our, our, again, our first test of planetary defense, and it is um, not a disruption mission, it is a deflection mission. And um, I can answer questions about whether it's later, whether it's best to deflect or disrupt. Um, but right now we're talking about deflection. 
Some of the other missions that are coming up related to planetary defense, um, the one on the left is the NEO surveillance mission. This is a mission that uh, I am also involved with. Uh, it's a space-based infrared telescope uh, that's going to be put at the Sun-Earth Lagrange 1 point. Uh, so it's between the Earth and the Sun, and it's looking outward uh, using infrared to pick up uh, asteroids and helping us find those smaller asteroids that we've had trouble finding from the ground. Um, in space, you can operate 24-7, and infrared is really good at finding uh, asteroids, especially because they don't, they only emit uh, sunlight reflected off them. So using optical means is difficult if they're small and dark. Of course, if they're small and dark um, in infrared, you can detect them much more easily than optical means. And this mission will probably launch in the 2025-2026 timeframe as it stands right now. Also involved with the European mission, helping out uh, with uh, HERA mission. So this is a mission that's going to be launched in uh, October of 2024. It is actually going to the uh, Didymus Dimorphos system, and it's going to characterize the uh, impact crater and, and figure out what we actually did to Dimorphos, although it gets there a little bit later. But it's part of ESA's uh, space safety and security program. And it has been approved, and it, it looks like it's going to move forward. So it's uh, really good news about that. So this all, when we talk about DART and we talk about HERA, this is part of the AIDA, uh, which is the Asteroid Impact and Deflection uh, Assessment International Cooperation uh, Team, as you will. So this is, this is how we cooperate. We have DART, which is going to intercept and hit the asteroid uh, Dimorphos in 2022, and then HERA will rendezvous with the system and uh, characterize it in uh, 2026. This is just a, a give you an idea of the HERA mission scenario. Um, again, launched in October of 2024. Um, has a couple of year uh, crews. It has some uh, framing cameras on it. So cameras to do some investigations, some CubeSats, laser altimeter, uh, an infrared um, camera, and also a spectral imager to characterize the asteroid. And it conducts some, some uh, investigations, uh, deploys CubeSats, and investigates the target uh, for about six to eight months and maybe possibly have an extended mission. But the whole idea is to try and figure out, uh, characterize the dimorphos and see what we actually did to it with, with DART and then test out some other uh, technologies, especially with the CubeSats that will be uh, deployed around the system to investigate uh, Didymos and dimorphos. Okay, this is um, a video. Uh, just to show you that this is the double asteroid redirection test. It's um, it, it's a neat video. Um, it just shows you the spacecraft de being deployed. Uh, it's launched on a Falcon 9. Uh, these are the rollout solar arrays that are being deployed. That is the uh, Draco cover coming off, so the camera. There's uh, Didymos and Dimorphos and Earth. Uh, orbit, and here comes DART, and ready for our uh, impact deflection test. There's Leech Q being deployed probably about 10 days prior to impact, and uh, you'll see Draco there acquire the target and come in for a successful impact, and that's uh, NASA's first planetary defense mission. And with that, I will uh, uh, take questions, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you very much. This is really great. We do have a number of questions. If anyone else has any other questions, please make sure to put them in the Q&A window. So if, uh, Paul, I don't know if you want to um, show yourself here, but that would uh, be great if we could. Yeah, yeah, let me do that. Let me just figure out what's uh, going on here. Uh, stand by. Am I, are you seeing me now? No. Nope, not yet. How about there? Oh, there wow. you go. There we are. Had to find the right button. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so a uh, long time ago, Carl uh, asked a question, um, and maybe this is the, the point of this, uh, of trying to figure what this out. So Carl asked, is the impact method to deter NEOs the most effective? Yeah, so that's a good question, Carl. And um, it is one of the most effective uh, methods we have. Um, there's also uh, the nuclear option. Again, a lot of it depends on the type of object and the situation that we're under. Um, we'd really like to test out the kinetic impact. We know how to run into things at high speed. We've done that and demonstrated it with a deep impact mission. Uh, if you remember that, that was a spacecraft that went in and hit a comet, right? And so um, we're able to do that at relatively high speed. Um, we want to be able to do this for planetary defense. When you start talking about nuclear weapons in space, people get very excited. Um, that's not to say that we wouldn't use them if we actually had to, um, but those are usually reserved for um, what we call last minute uh, measures. You know, if, if you don't have any choice, if the object's really, really big, uh, then you maybe you'd have to use a nuclear weapon. Or if you figure that maybe the time is so short that you, you don't have any option but to try and disrupt it, you can't deflect it uh, effectively, but you're trying to break it up into smaller pieces, again, so that not as much energy gets penetrated through to the Earth's atmosphere and down to the ground, then that might be an option. But right now, what we're looking at is uh, the kinetic impact. There's a few other esoteric um, techniques that we might try. Um, this is the one that we're trying first, and then we'll see how this goes and then go from there. All right. And so uh, related to deep impact, we uh, had a question from Gregory kind of uh, asking about the comparison. Um, now that we know a little bit about what you're looking for with this. And so he's wondering, were you able to measure a beta for the deep imp impact? Um, and then about the ejecta, was there more or less um, about what was expected for that collision? So deep impact was a science mission. It wasn't planetary defense. So, but the question is relevant and it's a good question. Um, deep impact was like, you know, it, the, the, the comet was really large. Um, we're talking a couple kilometer uh, diameter comet. Um, and the uh, projectile that, that went into it was uh, just a few hundred kilograms. Again, a little bit smaller than DART. Um, so think of like a small insect hitting a, a jet airliner at high speed. Um, really not too much that you're, you're going to do it. In fact, the, the comet actually overran the, the projectile from the spacecraft. Um, what was surprising was the, the number uh, or the amount of ejecta that came in. They were hoping to see the crater uh, as they flew by, but there was uh, quite a bit of ejecta that came up uh, because the, the comet was relatively unconsolidated material. Um, and that obscured the, the impact crater. Um, so there was no real beta uh, to determine from that. Um, the, just the energy associated with it wasn't enough. But for, for DART, um, because we're hitting something as a, a little bit smaller, it's 160-ish meters, um, we're gonna be able to, to measure a beta um, with our ground-based systems and, uh, and then have Hera go in and then refine that uh, estimate later on, maybe a few years later. All right, we have a couple questions about, uh, you know, thinking about the impact on dimorphos. And so Eileen asks, couldn't hitting dimorph dimorphos change its orbit so that it either hits Didymos or perhaps changes the, the system gravitational interactions and thus changing the primary asteroid's orbit itself? Right, uh, very good question. So another reason why we, we chose this particular uh, near Earth asteroid is number one, it's it's safe. So um, what we're going to do to this particular asteroid is if we hit uh, Dimorphos, which we plan on doing and hopefully we're successful, um, it's not going to change the heliocentric orbit uh, of the system at all, right? It, uh, if anything, it's going to be so minute that there's no hazard to Earth. We've done all the modeling and uh, we'd have to do a lot more uh, energetic things uh, and especially to the primary in order to do that. And this is uh, completely out of the realm. Um, but the question about um, changing uh, the orbit of Dimorphos, you know, we are gonna do that, but we're just gonna slow it down. Um, we don't think we're gonna send it uh, spinning into uh, Didymos or have anything happen like that. Um, the energies involved again are relatively small and modest. Uh, it would take a lot more energy to do that. And in fact, if we tried to do that, we'd probably end up disrupting 
uh, dimorphos before we'd actually uh, cause a, a significant change in the in that orbit uh, related to uh, Didymos. All right. And uh, I just have to say that Arnold had a very similar question about uh, um, do we have any idea of the movement of the larger asteroid if you hit the small one? And that sounds like... It, it's going to be really, really, I mean, we're, we're going to look for it, but it's going to be really hard to detect. Um, I don't, I don't, we don't expect any significant uh, change. All right, so let's see. Um, let's find another one. That, because, so Suzanne asks, and maybe you address this in, in one of your graphics, how do these asteroids compare in size to the larger ones like Ceres, Vesta, or Pallas? Yeah, so <clears throat> Ceres, Vesta, and Pallas, um, I tried to show that in the, in the original um, introductory remarks just to give people a sense of scale. Uh, Ceres is really large, right? So Ceres is a dwarf planet. Um, it's, uh, you know, roughly a, a, a thousand, uh, kilometers across Vesta's half the size it's 500, um, kilometers. Um, when you get down to some of these near earth asteroids that we're talking about, um, we really are looking at things in the uh, hundreds of meters, uh, range, um, the dinosaur impactor uh, is thought to be around 10 kilometers, right? Um, based on the, the crater um, that we found in the Yucatan. And so those objects we, we have got complete. We don't see any of those that are a hazard. We know where all of those are. Um, the one kilometer uh, and up, we've got about 90, 95% of those guys nailed and don't see any of those as a hazard but it's the objects that are in that um, sort of 500 down to 50 meter size range um, that we're really trying to concentrate on right now. And um, as you get down to smaller size ranges, you get down uh, to where objects can still cause a considerable amount of damage and there's lots of them. Um, they're also harder to see. So if you're big, you're easier to see. If you're small, you're harder to detect. So um, we really want to try and and find the smaller uh, population to retire the rest of the risk. We think we're pretty good at, at global effects, making sure we don't have anything sneak up on us that will give us a bad day. We still have a bit of work to do, but it's, it's more the regional and the city size guys that um, can wipe out those areas that we're trying to focus on right now. All right. So here's a question about the spacecraft. Alan is wondering, was the spacecraft mass increased to enhance momentum transfer? In other words, did you add significant, I guess, dead mass to the uh, spacecraft just specifically to increase that? Um, we, we did not. Um, you know, there's, there's the mass of the spacecraft. Um, we're, as you know, um, putting mass on spacecraft is uh, expensive. Uh, mass is, uh, you know, you, you, you cost your spacecraft by how massive it is and how much oomph it takes to throw it out into space. So we need to use a Falcon 9. We need to use a, a launch vehicle uh, that's appropriate for our, our particular test. Um, we could have added mass, but the amount when we looked at it, the, if we added any extra mass, substantial mass, it really wouldn't change much in terms of our objectives or our goals. Um, we'd have to, you know, develop a whole new different type of test and then use a bigger launch goal. And so then all of a sudden your cost of your mission increases dramatically and without much benefit. So again, keep in mind, this is just a first test. Um, we're trying to see what we have from this particular mass, 676 kilograms at 6.6 .6 kilometers per second and see what we can get as a result of this particular test. That's not to say that in future, um, tests, if we do uh, another kinetic impact, you know, maybe we'll ump up the, the mass a bit just to see and ump up the speed. Like I said, uh, maybe we'll, we'll double, uh, double the speed up to maybe 12 or 15 kilometers per second. But it's a very good question. But we, we did not do that for this time just because of our mission objectives for this demonstration mission. Well, you have to, you know, start out with a single data point and then move from there and then... Exactly. Exactly. More. Yep. So uh, Chris has a question, she's, uh, um, he or she, I'm wondering what would be the expected impact energy? Could you put that in perspective in terms of some of the terrestrial impact events? Um, so the impact energy if Dimorphos hit the earth? 
Um, is that what no, you're asking? I, I think that uh, related to the impact of uh, Dart into Dart. Oh, yeah. I, I, so keep in mind um, the, the objects that we're talking about. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, Chelyabinsk uh, was a 20 meter diameter asteroid, and it was roughly uh, 12,000 tons. Um, and coming in at high speed, uh, it was like 18 kilometers per second, uh, and it released an energy of, of you know, 440 kilotons. Okay, so um, anywhere from 15 to 20 times the explosive yield of um, the atomic weapons used in World War II, just to give you a sense. DART is much less. Uh, it's like 676 kilograms, moving at, at 6.6 .6 kilometers per second. So. It's still going to be an impact, but it's not going to be anything like any of the energy that's been released uh, for some of these bigger asteroids. If anything, it's going to be akin to some of the very, very smaller asteroids on the small size, like, you know, a three or four meter uh, meter guy, maybe even smaller than that. So um, much less energetic than, than some of these bigger guys, bigger asteroids coming in and hitting the Earth. I hope hope that answers uh, answers the question. So. Uh... Staying with Chelyabinsk for a, a minute, we had a couple of questions about that. Randall was wondering, um, was your group aware, or I guess was anyone aware of, of it before it hit our atmosphere? Yeah, so there's a, um, I'll tell you a funny story. So uh, uh, no one, it, it caught everybody surprise, surprise, because we were expecting um, another asteroid uh, to come through um, and it was DA-14. Right. So we're, everybody was looking for uh, DA-14, which was going to make this close approach uh, come up from the south. And everybody was focused on that. And all of a sudden, out of the direction of the sun came Chelyabinsk. And I remember uh, distinctly watching uh, congressional testimony of the uh, Air Force general who's in charge of uh, Space Command at the time. And he was asked the question, the same question is, when were you aware? And, and uh, his reply was, when it exploded over Russia. So, um, you know, these, these asteroids have a habit of, of coming in. Um, they're really hard to detect. And especially if they come from the sunward side, it's almost impossible to detect them until uh, the very last minute. So um, I was rudely awakened early in the morning uh, by my phone going off. And uh, it, was a, it was a very interesting day. Um, I've never been... Uh, so busy in all my life, but that was, it was an interesting time. And again, that's a talk for uh, another, another session. So I'm happy to give that one all about Chelyabinsk if you guys want. Right. So Gregory asks, uh, um, staying with Chelyabinsk, where is the main mass of the 1400 pounds that were collected now? Is it cut up or still intact as one piece? There might be some media collectors in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, yeah, you should. Um, there's lots of pieces of Chelyabinsk around, but the main mass is still relatively intact, as far as I understand it, uh, and it's still inside uh, Russia. It's, uh, you know, um, I think one of the things that happened when uh, they managed to get it out of the lake, they had to use divers, and they were held a press conference, and they were um, uh, trying to weigh the mass, measure the mass of it, and. Uh, it was it was really difficult because they weren't expecting it uh, how how dense it is and especially if you're not familiar with uh, the meteorites and and how heavy they can be uh, it was a bit surprising but as far as I know um, the entire mass is still there uh, but you can still get lots of fragments right um, if you looked at the fireball there were multiple uh, detonation events and that was one of the things that was really alarming for people was that when the uh, a asteroid hit the atmosphere and detonated, it wasn't a single point. It detonated a, a number of points across the sky and created that long contrail. And so when you look at it, your frame of reference is, okay, that's like a jet or that's like a missile. It's not that far up, but it was really, really big. That contrail was over 200 uh, kilometers long, very high up. And so you're looking at it and trying to get a sense of scale. And then 90 seconds or a bit, then you're hit with a shockwave and it's not just one shockwave. There's a main explosion and then several others. It was bang, 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 bang. And so the people there were really uh, thinking they were under attack. And so that's what made it very scary for them because they had no idea. Fortunately, um, the Russian military knew right away what was what was happening. Once the reports were coming in, they could see 
uh, as well as the um, you know U.S. defense assets as well. Yeah. So, but an exciting time. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go for two more questions, and I'm going to apologize in advance for uh, the questions that we're not getting to. Uh, Irene uh, wonders if you could address the Friday the 13th, 2029 asteroid Apophis, <laughs> whether it will need to be moved. I read early reports that it would hit Earth and later that it wouldn't. Yeah, I'll address that one real quick. So good question. Apophis has been uh, on our minds quite a bit. It's still a really interesting asteroid. There's going to be a close flyby of it, uh, April 13th, uh, 2029. Um, NASA, we're figuring out what we're going to actually uh, do in terms of a scientific investigation. Um, fortunately, it had a relatively close approach not too long ago, and we managed to get some radar data on it. And so radar is really good at determining uh, precise orbit uh, and also physical characteristics of the asteroid if it gets close enough. And in this case, it did. And you can propagate the orbit if you have really good data and propagate it out for a long period of time, even though it may come close to the Earth. And one of the things that the radar data showed us is that Apophis is not going to hit us for another 100 plus years. It's not a hazard. So right now, uh, it's not a threat, and we don't have to move it. But the fact that it's going to be uh, coming very close uh, to Earth, it's a fact it's going to be third magnitude. So you guys could see it naked eye if you're in Africa and Europe. Um, it's going to be a really good opportunity for a scientific study. So that's one of the reasons why we're excited about it. So a chance to uh, study a 300 meter ish size asteroid as it makes a very close approach to earth. So it's a great opportunity. All right. And our last question from William basically is wondering uh, what can we do to get better at observing and discovering objects coming from the sun's direction? So it's a really, really good question, William. And so that's one of the reasons why we're really uh, looking forward to the NEO surveillance mission going up. So that's the, um, the spacecraft that I mentioned um, launch in about 2026 timeframe. Uh, we're hoping uh, it's in development right now. And that will be placed between the Earth and Sun at Lagrange point one. And it's a stable orbit and it's an infrared telescope. And basically what it will do is it will scan the sky. Uh, it doesn't look at the sun, but it looks in the direction of the sun, but it looks covers the, the approach areas of asteroids uh, from that direction, right? And so it covers our blind spots. So we have our ground-based optical telescopes that will work at nighttime, and they tend to work more at opposition. So looking at the opposite direction of the sun. And now we'll have the NEO surveillance mission um, that will work uh, in the opposite direction and looking more direct towards the direction of the sun and cover that blind spot. So um, we're hoping with that system and then the Vera Rubin telescope coming online, uh, we'll have a lot more information on these type of objects um, and hopefully find these uh, asteroids before they find us. And that's the goal. If we can find them early enough, then we can prepare and make a natural hazard completely disappear. And that's one of the things that me and my colleagues here at NASA and, and around the world, we're working very hard to make sure uh, we don't get hit again and we can prevent this natural disaster from happening. Right. Well, thank you so much for all that you do. And thank you so much for coming and, and sharing with us. It's uh, um, really enlightening and, and really a, a fascinating uh, tech, uh, technology demonstration mission. And one of the things too, before we uh, close, as we've noted in the past, bringing these webinars to you is truly a team effort. Over the years, Paige Graff, who is uh, one of our panelists this evening, and, and maybe she'll turn her camera on, from the ARIES program at, John, at NASA Johnson Space Center has introduced us to a great many scientists over the years who we have featured in these webinars. Thank you, Paige, for all you have done to help us bring the very best of NASA science to the Night Sky Network. So thank you. And that's all for tonight. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paige. Thank you, Dave and Vivian. And thank you all of you for tuning in. And you can join us for our next webinar on Thursday, October 28th, when Dr. Robert Zellum will share with us what we currently know about exoplanets. Um, you know, we're going to go from the ones that are really near Earth to the most distant uh, 
um, planets out there around other stars, and how all of us can get involved as citizen scientists. Also join us on Saturday, October 9th, as Dave noted earlier, for an international Observe the Moon Night kickoff party. You can find an archive of these webinars on the Night Sky Network website, in the Outreach Resources session, section, and on the NSN YouTube channel. So keep looking up and we will see you all next month in just a couple of weeks, actually. So good night, everyone. And recording. <laughs>